Good afternoon. It's good to see all of you and all of the folks who are watching over the internet. I appreciate your being here. My name is David Gray, and on behalf of the New America Foundation and Lisa Guernsey, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the event today, Local Innovations in Child Care and Early Learning. As you all know, child care and early learning are incredibly important topics for our country. More than 11 million children under five are in some kind of early care setting each day, but yet too few of us as parents uh, and as stakeholders in our country are satisfied with the quality of, of care generally um, and the balance that parents try to achieve in, in placing their children in a setting that is high quality while also having the support they need to go to work. And yet we know that quality dual generational child care and early learning are critical for social mobility in our country. Unfortunately, though, there are some strong local innovators that are making a difference at the local level uh, that provide uh, examples that can be replicated and lessons that can be learned for those national policymakers, some of whom are in this room, some of whom are watching uh, to replicate. And so we're grateful for your attendance here as well as for our uh, speakers and presenters today. This is an unusual kind of event in which we have some folks who are here live and some folks uh, who are here uh, remotely. Uh, but that's the great thing about the 21st century. So I'm going to introduce folks briefly and then uh, more as we go through this event. Uh, you'll hear from Lisa Guernsey, the director of our Early Education Initiative in just a moment, and from Tanja Rucker from the National League of Cities. We're going to talk, myself, Lisa, and Tanja for a few minutes uh, about um, introducing both this event, the topic, why it's important, uh, why it's important to local communities, as Tanja explains. And then we're going to hear from four programs across the country, representing different parts of the country, different families, but have a common goal of trying to provide quality dual generational uh, child care. And we're going to hear from folks as they are continuing their work even today with their local programs and have taken time out to be part of, us, of this event. We'll hear from Aaron Gallagher and Kathy Wall of the Children's Services Council of Palm Beach County, Florida. From Monica uh, Barzak of the Community Action Project in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, from Barbara Faber, uh, Director of Child Care Programs at the White Earth Tribal Council in Minnesota, where it is colder today than it is in Palm Beach, Florida. And from Katie Britton from Fr uh, Thrive in Five in Boston, Massachusetts. So representing different parts of our, our country, we'll have some, some opportunity to hear from innovators at the local level about what is making a difference in this space in their communities. Then Tanja and Lisa and I will uh, ask them some questions that they'll respond to. And then we should have about a half hour, we hope, uh, for you all to ask questions. And so we'll have a microphone that will allow you to ask some questions of our speakers. All right? So thanks again for being here. Let's uh, begin with Lisa, Lisa Guernsey. Thanks, David, very much. And thanks, everyone, for, for coming today. I want to give a special thanks actually to David for really doing the lion's share of the work in organizing this and um, as he's described this is one of these kind of great uh, experimental 21st century kind of events where we're really trying to bring conversations um, together across the country um, without having to always put everyone on an airplane to do so. So um, thanks again to everybody on the phone um, who will be pr presenting in just a few minutes. I really appreciate that. We've been talking about this as dual generational child care, and I want to explain a little bit about what we mean by that. The focus really is on helping parents gain stability in jobs and income while ensuring that children have a high quality space in which to learn when their parents are at their jobs. This is I think a critical approach to not only making sure that children are getting what they need, but that their families are getting what they need as well. So that we've seen some moves at the federal level for more investment in the early years, such as the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge, and certainly the budget request put forward by President Obama asks for more money for child care, which is a, a positive development. But the reality today is that federal dollars are not rising in any dramatic way for child care. And in fact, there are still big concerns that debt reduction efforts, also well needed, will require a trimming of federal programs. So while new pushes for smart federal policy and investment are certainly important, we also need to look locally for innovation and answers on the child care and the workforce front. So to help us understand this, I am very um, pleased to introduce Tanja Rucker today to, to set out for us you know, what the challenges are. Tanja is the Principal Associate for Early Childhood at the National League of Cities in the Institute for Youth Education and Families. 
and I have gotten to know Tanja over the years. We've worked together on several projects. She always brings a really kind of incisive um, brain to what it means for those on the ground, the people in cities and communities when we talk about collaborating, when we talk about sharing data, when we talk about what standards are and how to align them, we talk about what this means for, for families in different, different situations. And so I'm really pleased to have her with us here. From the past year or more, the National League of Cities has been working on several important case studies of cities that are trying to move the needle by collaborating and sharing data and expertise among many different players on the ground in these, area, uh, in these, in these communities, whether it's um, community-based centers that are doing child care and early learning, uh, whether it's uh, health and services agencies within cities, and many other programs as well. So I'm sure she's going to tell us more about those today. Um, but I just want to stress that the National League of Cities is really an important communication point for leaders in localities, leaders who want to learn more, want to innovate, and need models to get it done. Tanja is one of those important connection points at the National League of Cities. So thank you, Tanja, for being here. And um, I'll leave it to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of the senior management team and the leadership at the National League of Cities, we, I want to thank the New America Foundation, David and, and Lisa in particular, um, for the invitation and for the opportunity to talk with you for a few minutes about local innovation around early care and education. The National League of Cities is the nation's largest national organization that represents the interest of cities. We have over 1,600 members who are active um, and, and voting members within the National League of Cities. And I work within the Institute for Youth Education and Families. And that's a special entity designed specifically to work with mayors, council members, and city leaders um, to help them think through and develop programs and policies in strengthening families and improving outcomes for children children and youth. And over the past decade, we're proud of the work that elected officials have implemented or are continuing to implement around supporting and providing positive and great outcomes for our youth. Well, today, Lisa and David asked that I begin my remarks by talking a little bit and putting on my local, my local hat, the local lens, to look through innovation around child care through local government. What does it look like? And to talk with you a little bit why child care and workforce development is so important to keeping cities strong, and in some instances, even revitalizing those cities that are struggling a little bit. So I wanted to, to first just start out by talking about why this is important. There are a number of factors that one can consider when thinking about a vibrant, healthy community. And for our members of the National League of Cities, they recognize that quality, early education, and meeting the needs of young children, that's a foundational point. And when folks are looking and thinking about what makes a city healthy, having a strong quality early education center is at the top of that list. So for the past decade, we've seen municipal leaders roll up their sleeves and develop programs and policies that really support young children. We know that having a strong and innovative set of early care and education policies contributes to the overall productivity of a community. It really does attract business, businesses to the community. It provides a strong economic base. And most importantly, it promotes health and well-being for young children and families. So municipal leaders are committed and engaged to this work. And they know that quality early ed and quality child care is an important tool for success. Well, what are we hearing from Main Street? You know, what's, what's the pulse? What are we hearing? And, you know, I can't go any further without just acknowledging the challenging economic times that we're in. And so we're hearing that elected officials and their staff, they're really trying to find ways to preserve the work that's already underway, you know, with tremendous budget cuts and layoffs. They want to preserve the work and the gains that have been made to support young children. We also hear that from parents of young children, there's a lot of isolation and not being connected to resources. So what can we are working with elected officials to help them think through how best to engage all parents, connect them to resources to provide a, a healthy start to their um, to the, for their young children. And finally, accessing childcare is just a challenge. Um, the market has priced basic, basic items such as childcare above what many families can afford. Local officials are trying 
trying to provide a safety net, and I'm going to talk through in just a few minutes about a couple of strategies that we're seeing that are quite innovative and in helping support parents access quality early education. So what can city leaders do? That's the question, and that's what we're working with our members on a daily basis, to think through innovation and strategies. And one thing that we're seeing is that city leaders can play a tremendous role in improving the quality of care that's already existing. What comes to mind is cities that are really engaged in helping bring up the quality of early education. And what I mean is around aligning curriculum and improving instructional practices. Cities such as Jacksonville, Florida, are really engaged in providing professional development and training for, for early educators across the continuum. And that includes partnering with the school district, K through three folks, to provide a strong professional development continuum to raise the instructional practices practices within the classroom. The city of Jacksonville um, actually implements and has provided coaches for their early education centers. They also connect with the school district and they provide training throughout the year and every year they hold a, a very large coaches and, and Early Ed Providers Institute. And during this time, they provide and bring in national experts, national thought leaders, and very practical ways to help teachers and educators think through how to improve instructional practices in the classroom. Similarly, the folks in San Antonio, Texas, very similar. They have a focus on informal caregivers, recognizing that many of our young kids are not in traditional child care centers. They're being um, cared for by mothers, neighbors, informal providers. And so Cities are recognizing the need to connect to those providers very early on and to provide training and strategies for those um, providers as well. And finally, I just learned this past week, the folks in Santa Monica, California, are really addressing the needs of the challenging behaviors that many of our three and four year olds are exhibiting in classrooms and in childcare settings. And so they've brought on mental health and behavioral specialists to, to actually go into the centers to work with staff and to also work with K through three teachers to help strengthen and shore up the quality of the instructional practice in the classroom. So that's certainly one strategy that cities are really actively engaged to help ensure a strong quality early ed program. Also, I find that um, there's a new, not really new, but many cities are looking for ways to explore and implement these one-stop hubs. The one the place where families can go, they can access information about child care, child care subsidies, get connected to providers, and at the same time have access to other comprehensive support services. In Louisville, Kentucky, they have a model called Neighborhood Place. It's a partnership of public sector agencies that have come together to create a network hub of a one-stop shop. Neighborhood places led by Louisville Metro government, and together with their key stakeholders, they provide blended child care, education, employment, workforce development, and human services support for children and the family members. So that's another strategy that we see that you have a place where folks can go, you know, and what they say in Louisville is, Tanja, this is how we do business here. There's a one-stop shop. Folks know they're going to get support on terms of food stamps and housing and child care all in one place. So we see these one-stop hub, these one-stop um, hub models implemented throughout the country. And finally, we do see cities that are also helping increase the supply of child care through CCDBG funding, public housing, capital grant dollars, and many cities have local dedicated tax revenue to support quality early education services to build a supply. So we see that cities are working towards quality, they're working towards professional development, and to increase the number of child care slots that are available in their local communities. So these are just a couple of strategies, things that we see on the ground. And I want to put this in context of, the, of NLC's work with cities to provide a smooth continuum of services from birth, from cradle, actually to grave. And you hear that a lot among city leaders. They, want to reckon, they are recognizing the importance of connecting early ed through post-secondary, that what you start laying the foundation through early education, quality programs, really provide a great launching pad to align work. And more recently, we're partnering and working with the Annie Casey Foundation 
Association and some key stakeholders on a great level reading campaign because we recognize the importance of the early years, quality early education and access is key to some of the latter outcomes. So what can uh, elected officials do? They can certainly help set the vision and goal to certainly partner with um, other key stakeholders to coordinate efforts and build political will. And I, in my closing, I must say that this is all done with working with key partners and stakeholders. And some of you are here today, the United Ways of across the country, the school districts, the local stakeholders and foundations are key partners in this effort. So cities are looking and they're working with their key stakeholders to provide a comprehensive program and services for young children. And what we've learned is folks are on the front end of this. There's a long ways to go. Aligning education, providing quality, it's, it's, it's very, it's, there's a lot of layers to this. And city leaders know they cannot do it by themselves. So with partnering with key stakeholders, we're looking to um, move the needle and make sure that all children and families ma maximize their full potential. So there's just a couple of thoughts of how the National League of Cities, working with city governments, working with senior leaders to ensure that quality early education is on the radar of our cities across the nation. And it is an important issue. Thank you. Aha, our slides. Thank you, Tanja. I'd like to build on two things she, that Tanja mentioned. First, in terms of the partnerships. And I'd like to thank our, uh, the inspiration for, for our work in this area is, is as well, uh, largely from the Annie Casey Foundation, which has large been, largely been promoting uh, and long been a leader in thinking about the importance of dual generational quality childcare. Tanja mentioned both the one-stop centers uh, and the workforce development angle for helping parents, as well as the quality angle for children. And that focus on dual generational uh, uh, outcomes um, for both parents and children is so critical to social mobility. Uh, and we appreciate very much uh, the Annie Casey Foundation's encouragement of this kind of work. The second thing is, is how things on the ground in cities are working so well uh, or not working well in a resource-constrained environment. And uh, in Washington, um, you know, when we look at CCDBG reauthorization, when we look at how we improve uh, federal programs, it's so critical to hear from what is going on uh, uh, in uh, programs in all parts of the country which are providing work. And we have four really award-winning programs uh, which are moving the needle in their communities and which have some uh, lessons, I think, that they've learned uh, in successes and things that haven't gone as well uh, that can be replicated uh, and some information to share. And so uh, we have the opportunity here to hear from uh, our four different programs, and we're going to do that now for a moment. We're going to begin with Palm Beach. Erin and Kathy, are you there? We are here. Excellent. All right. So Erin Gallagher, Program Officer uh, for the Children's Services Council of Palm Beach County, Florida, and Kathy Wall, who's a Systems Director for the Housing Partnership uh, Br Br Bridges Initiative. All right. The, um, the floor is yours. Uh, as they say. All right, great, thank you. Um, nice to speak to everyone up there. I'm, I'm sure our weather's a little nicer. I won't go into detail as to how nice it is down here right now. But just to start it's, off, I'll explain a little bit it's about... It's pretty darn nice in D.C. I'm, today. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not even going to get into it then. Um, just to explain a little bit of background on what the Children's Services Council is. It's uh, an agency we have in Florida that's a special tax, taxing district. There are seven across the state. And within Palm Beach County, we leverage uh, property tax dollars, a small percentage that come into our office to fund programs for children. We also have graded funding sources that come in through the state and federal government that we combine to uh, provide these services within the county. So that's a little bit about our agency. Um, and we're going to be talking about one of our efforts during this presentation, which is Bridges of Highland. Our agency is also responsible. Tanja gave a great intro for us for the quality rating improvement system within the county for early care, the quality improvement system for after school. Uh, but we're going to be talking about bridges today, and we're talking specifically about bridges at Highland. This is one of 10 of our place-based efforts within the county, um, and this is one where we also have a federal funding stream coming in that we're going to be highlighting. I'm going to pass it over to Kathy. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Bridges at Highland is excited to be a part of the full service community school uh, project. And the pictures that you just saw were actually some of our faces from Highland. If you look at uh, Palm Beach County, it's actually about 120 square miles. It's the largest county east of geographical county uh, east of the Mississippi. 
We have one particular community called Lake Worth, Florida, where there is Highland Elementary. And this particular school is unique in that there's about 900 students, 65% um, Hispanic, which actually accounts for our Guatemalan Mayan community, and 35% uh, black, which accounts for um, Asian Creole community. Um, this community is very interesting, extremely humble, and just a pleasure to work with. Most of our families are new uh, to the United States. Um, most of our families, uh, we have a high undocumented population. Our families typically have about, the, the parents have about a fourth grade education. So having a school home or being a part of a school family is new to them which is a very big concept for us, um, just like we work with families to have a medical home so when you do get sick or need treatment, you have a place to go. Well, we're putting that same concept in the community to have a school home. Um, when your child is ready for school, where will you go? And how can you get involved with the school um, ahead of time? Um, if you don't mind, go to the next slide. And we'll talk a little bit about our, um, our vision for the school, which talks with the, um, let's see, are we at the next slide? There, thank All you. Right. Thank you. Which talks about really the, the, the center of the bullseye, uh, probably in most of your communities, is the child. Um, and bringing the child into um, our program early on, um, well before kindergarten. We actually want to work with the child. Um, our, we have outcomes that we work for, and we talk about healthy births, having children eager and ready to learn before they enter kindergarten, um, decreasing abuse and neglect for our kids, and having them ready for school and ready readers uh, when they are in third grade. And Obviously, the child can't do that alone, so we work very closely with the families, involving parents early on, having parents be a part of their child's education. We actually build in with our pre-K classes um, parent-child involvement uh, activities, which are often the last hour of the child's school day. So the parent comes an hour before pickup and joins class, and that's been hugely successful and that has trickled on to many parent-child activities in the evening uh, for our families. Uh, the next ring you can see is the neighborhood and community and having parents be involved with their school, having parents involved with their neighborhoods, um, whether it's neighborhood cleanups, uh, school initiatives, school activities. Uh, again, the school is their home at least for six to eight hours of the day for, for many of our kids. So really feeling a part of their community and their neighborhood. Our strategy is to bring agencies and organizations to the school to provide services. Um, our community is particularly a walking community. Um, transportation has uh, historically been an issue. And so having agencies work on site for us um, has been great. Um, having, having then uh, a sense of society. Uh, having families invest in our, our outcomes. So we're not prescribing saying, here are your issues, you're having low birth weight babies, you know, your children aren't ready for school, um, but having families understand the importance of healthy babies and children ready for school. And when they enter kindergarten, that they do, um, they, if they've been in pre-K, then they are ready for kindergarten, and when they're ready for kindergarten, they tend to do better on third grade assessment. Um, if we can click to the next slide, Erin. We're doing the tag team approach here. <laughs> so as we move into looking at the next slide for our success pipeline, this works up and it also works across. So within our bridges locations, all of the pieces you see that are stacked are present within the bridges. So. We have family and child support. It's a place-based approach that's located directly in this Lake Worth neighborhood that Kathy described. We also have quality child care. This program for our early care is part of our quality improvement system, which we call Quality Counts. And we also have a quality after school setting at this location. And beyond that, we have a number of services that are targeted to the individual child and family. And those types of services can be combined based on family need. And as Kathy discussed, these are all towards 
our goals of having babies born healthy, children free from abuse and neglect, readiness for kindergarten, and success by the end of third grade in particular, we're focusing on reading. The amazing thing that we've been able to do at Bridges because of the funding streams we have coming in is we've been able to build a pipeline in terms of education that's starting at 18 months where we can engage families in the parent-child home program. And we actually recently just added a two classroom at the site. So now we're able to serve two-year-olds, three-year-olds, and fours, which are part of our voluntary pre-K, in the Bridges location, which is directly next to the school, so those children have a really lovely, smooth transition into the kindergarten. And it's a really nice way to make that connection for them, very seamless, very easy, that that's been part of their educational home for a number of years. We're very, very proud of that. We're going to go to the next slide. All of our um, attempts to, to work with the families, um, one of the things we talk about is that we can have the, the most beautiful pre-K classroom in the world and have the best curriculums and the newest and the latest toys uh, for the kids. But at the end of the day, you know, the kids go home. And if the families aren't engaged and um, the parents aren't a part of their child's learning process, then the child's day really ends at 2 or whenever they, they leave school. So part of our approach is to bring as many partners into the school, to bring as many partners into the community, if not physically out of the school, but to bring these partnerships to the community to provide services for the family. Um, bridges, our concept is really um, as, as to coordinate a system of care. And uh, it, it was interesting, we, we heard a great analogy a week or so ago uh, that the Bridges was typically almost like a, a flight control, where we have all these flights coming in and out uh, to service our community and how is that coordinated. Um, if you can see the different partnerships that we have and with Bridges in the center, again, coordinating those services. Um, but also one thing that we, not only with our four classrooms that we have on site at the elementary school, but we're very involved with our Head Starts in the community and our other child care providers and our fi family child care providers so that, again, even though they're on, not on site at, at, Highland, Ele at um, Highland Elementary, um, they're still a part of our community. And when they enter kindergarten, we want them to be eager and ready to learn as well. So if we can go to the next slide, we're going to break down kind of the big picture of how we fund Highland Bridges. Um, right now, we have funding that does come in from the Department of Education as part of a federal grant um, that's a little more than 500000 a year, which is a huge support, especially to those classrooms. We also have mentoring that is supported by that grant and our parent child home program in addition to a nutrition program. Um, through CSC funding, there's an additional um, over half a million that comes in, and our school district provides a fair amount of in-kind through time, services, and support. The other piece we have is CCC funding, which is Continue to Care funding, and those are scholarships that are provided to children so that they can attend uh, the child care within the um, Highland site that we talked about. And then when you put all those funds together and you start to break it down and you look at the pie graph, you can see how much goes into our classrooms, how much goes towards our mentoring program that serves our school age population, how much goes to parent child home, which I talked about, which starts at 18 months, and how much goes towards our nutrition component. So we're very lucky at the site that we're able to braid from several sources so we can bring a number of services to the community. And the last piece that we can flip to, we're going to talk about some of our initial sites. Highland is, of all of our bridges, the site that is the most mature, and these were some results from our 2011 year. One of the services we provide to our early learning children is that we do screen for developmental delays. And last year, all the children that we had identified at risk, there was a small number, but of all those children, they were linked to services, and it was done quickly. All of the families who participated in our family, or in our parent-child home program, excuse me, increased the frequency of their positive verbal interactions, and 100% of the children demonstrated positive behavior traits. So this was a fabulous, fabulous benchmark for us. And 100% of the early learning classroom families came to at least three parent-child activities, which was so key. We really want to create that home school connection with families 
that school is a place that they can feel comfortable, that can be a home for them, that can be a place where they feel that there's trust and respect. And so to have that participation for families has been so key. And we were particularly proud last year for Bridges of Highland, all of the children who left the Bridges of Highland BPK um, and then went to kindergarten were tested as part of the readiness um, standards that are in Florida and received an overall readiness score of 77.8. Why that was significant was because when we compared that against Thailand children who had not been in our VPK program who entered kindergarten without it, their average score was 33.1. And even when we compared it against the county, which is everyone in the county, whether they went to a very affluent preschool um, or a preschool like Highland or something in between, we outscored the county average, which was only 72.8. So working within this community and this population, that was huge. Um, to have those types of high scores and, and something for us to really celebrate. And that is a very brief, fast overview of Bridges of Highlands. Good. Well, Aaron and, and Kathy, thank you very much. Um, we're looking forward to diving into some Q&A, a couple things that, that that prompted for myself. But we're going to go next to Tulsa, Oklahoma, also probably a warm day in Tulsa. And Monica Barzak, the director of the Innovation Lab of the Community Action Project. Um, Monica, would you tell us about um, uh, what's made a difference for your program? Or where your sure, program absolutely. And it is a beautiful sunny day here, so we're very happy about that. Um, Community Action Project is an anti-poverty agency that works so that, that children that we serve grow up and achieve economic success so that their children are not born into poverty. And what I want to focus on today is one of the pieces of this very big puzzle um, called Career Advance. So Community Action Project has for a long time been providing high quality early childhood education um, to low income children uh, from the ages of birth to five. We currently serve just over 2,000 children in Tulsa County. Um, but several years ago, we wanted to get a little bit more um, intentional about how we might help the parents and the families um, of those children um, get to a more economically, financially stable situation. So Career Advance is our dual generation workforce development program um, that, that we hope will accomplish that goal. Um, the, the important sort of contextual pieces for us is that we worked very hard in the program design to think about barriers to parents um, who want to improve their workforce skills, who want to go on to training, but may not have been successful doing that in the past. And so we um, worked with um, several experts in the field to really come up with ways to identify those barriers and think about how we might remove them. And then the other important piece to us is that the end goal here is a family supporting wage. Um, and we started in the healthcare sector. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, so of course our hypothesis here is um, that the economic success of the parents are going to help, is going to help improve the educational outcomes for their children. And this really stems um, from a project that was done in Milwaukee a number of years ago called New Hope, uh, a make work pay program that ended up showing some improvements in the child's um, education and so so that's kind of where we're coming from with career advance and we're particularly hopeful that economic stability might help counteract some of the factors that contribute to the fade out effect of high quality early education um, so next slide please oh sorry key program elements right okay so um, some of the things I just wanted to point out that we built into the design is of course it's offered to adults who already have their young children enrolled in our high quality early education. Uh, by and large, they are parents, but we also have a few grandparents that participate in the program. It is sector-based, um, so we focus on the healthcare sector, or we conducted quite a bit of research to determine which sector would be appropriate. Um, we really wanted to look at a sector where there were jobs available and projected needs for skilled employees. 
Um, and we do have a um, someone on our staff who works with the healthcare employers in the area. Um, she visits with them on a regular basis to understand what their needs are, and then to sort of market our program and our graduates to them. Uh, we've built a career path training. Um, comprised of different steps. And so what we were going for here is that while we hope the parents reach the end goal, which is an associate's degree, either in, in nursing or in health information technology, if they're not able to do that um, or they don't want to do that, they can get out of the program with a credential that is recognized in the marketplace and they, they will be able to get employment. And we also wanted to make the steps accessible. Again, uh, for a lot of our parents, they may not have been successful in school in the past, and, and we wanted them to be able to attain um, higher degrees of success. We built in career coaching, um, so every participant works with their own career coach on an individual and group basis, um, and that includes soft skills development. And the soft skills development and the role of the coach also is built into a peer support um, model, which I'll talk about more in just a minute. Um, we recognize that some of our participants may need uh, reading or math skills upgrades and um, preparation in getting ready to be a college student. Uh, when we first began, um, we, in fact, we, we never required that a participant need a GED to participate or a high school diploma to participate, and so we will help them with that, but we found that even adults who have a diploma um, may not be at a sufficient level for college reading or math. So we build in um, that kind of support and instruction. Um, and then the last key element is performance incentives. So for good attendance, for good grades, for receiving your credential or um, uh, certain key milestones, a participant can earn up to $3,000 per year. This, again, was drawn out of the New Hope experience, which uh, was a make-work-pay, trying to help parents um, have sufficient economic resources to be able to provide for their families. Okay, so the next slide, please. I want to talk about one of the things that we've really found to be successful, um, and that is this idea of cohorts. And so, like probably most programs, we enroll a class of, say, 15 at a time. So every January, every August, we enroll 15 in our nursing track, 15 in our health information technology track. Um, but we start them three to four weeks before their classes begin to develop them as a cohort in these peer partner meetings. And what they can do there is they can share with each other their experiences, their struggles, their successes, and it is also a way for us to deliver some of the soft skills development. So we might bring in guest speakers to talk about uh, resume building, interviewing skills. The coaches might plan a session on professionalism, professional dress in the workplace, conflict resolution, etc. And we found that the, the support that the participants build in these cohorts is really unbelievable. Um, they see their fellow participants as a family, and they really understand what they're going through. So if you move on to the next slide, I just pulled, um, we do regular focus groups with our participants. And I, I, I picked a few um, uh, key quotes that they had made, and it's especially about the fact that the cohorts, because everyone is a parent or a grandparent and they have young kids, they're going through very similar issues um, in a way that may not be true if they were just working through the VOTEC or working through the community college. Um, so just that second quote in particular, we're all parents of young kids. We understand where we're coming from with kids the same age. We understand each other's problems. And even in the last focus group we, we had, um, there was quite a bit of discussion about one participant who um, felt like she wanted to drop out. And before the career coach even knew, her, her cohort mates knew about it. And three or four of them had kind of ganged up on her and called her up and said, no, 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 you can't quit. We're going to keep you in here. We're going to help you get through it. And, and sure enough, she stuck in. So that's been a really, I think, important piece of the model. On the next slide, I talk a little bit about some of the challenges, um, and these were alluded to uh, 
in some of what Tanja said and, and I think others have experienced, which is we, um, we are able to match the class schedule to the schedule of the children um, to match the full day Head Start schedule. Um, but it starts to get a little bit difficult once the parents begin thinking about employment um, and when they have to do their clinical experiences, which is required for the class. So one of the advantages of doing this through early childhood education is our staff at the centers are so committed to the Career Advance program, they make sure that their building is staffed to provide the before or after care that's needed, um, especially during the, the clinical experiences, which could last a week or it could last three weeks. Um, it's a little tougher when the parent now might be offered an internship or a part-time employment opportunity or something where they really need before and after care. Um, and so for us, there are certain, um, I think, barriers at the state level about how we can try to help parents access um, quality child care that they need outside of our regular operating hours. And then, of course, like I'm sure most communities have, trying to match the child care schedule to what's available, to what the parents need um, is also difficult. Uh, on the next slide, I talk a little bit about um, some of our partnerships. We have a lot of local partners on the ground, our technical college, our community college, a local public school district, and everybody at those partner agencies is highly committed to what it is that we're doing, but they operate in an institutional setting. And so it's been a little bit challenging um, to try to navigate and negotiate institutional changes and trying to um, make sure that the needs of our students and, and probably the needs of many other students at the community college is considered kind of in advance. And so we started instituting quarterly all partner meetings so where we could have these kinds of conversations from a more systemic level. Um, but, that, but that's been a little bit of a challenge for us. On the next slide, um, at the state level, um, the grant funding, the federal funding we have to support Career Advance requires that we partner with certain um, state agencies. Um, and it's, it's very interesting because, you know, sort of looking at it from a particular level, some of these agencies seem like they would be very natural partners in a program dedicated to helping parents of young children um, become more job ready. Uh, but there are definitely um, limitations, regulations, and requirements that, that make that a little bit difficult. And, and from our perspective, I think about this in terms of sustainability of this kind of program and scaling it up. So if, if federal funding disappears for this program, how would the larger system in a, in a city or a state be able to provide the quality services that we believe we are going to find are, are necessary for, for programs to have success? And the, the final slide is just the, the plug that we make for, for our federal funding through um, Department of Health and Human Services who, who um, have been funding this program and, and up until 2015. Great. Monica, thank you very much, and I look forward to following on that in, in Q&A as well. Now I'd like to introduce um, Barbara Faber, uh, who's from the White Earth uh, Reservation Ojibwe Nation in, in Minnesota, where it is colder today, uh, but a program officer for um, CCDF for a while, last 20 years. And as you know, as a sovereign nation, there's a government-to-government -government relationship with the um, with the reservation, so they receive direct uh, CCDF funding. So it's a, it's a, um, we're, we're very pleased, Barbara, that you are with us today. Your slides are up, and uh, the internet is yours. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, miigwech for uh, providing me with this opportunity. I can't see what, um, I'm having technical difficulties, and so I can't see what's on the slide, but I'm, uh, I know they're there. Um, yes, I, I'm going to take in a little different um, aspect. I am from a tribal community, and as David said, we are a sovereign nation, so we get direct block grant funding um, for CCDF. And so we provide many of the services that the state also provides. One of the, um, 
one of the things that I'm very, very proud of is our, our program. We've been, we've been in existence for about 20 years now, ever since um, the Child Care Development Block Grant became available. And um, the next slide, please. Uh, we recruit and license uh, child care providers throughout our reservation, which is the 1,300 square mile um, service area. And what we do is we, we make sure that um, we try to have child care in every community. There's 11 communities within our service area and try to have, and we're very rural. Um, so having uh, child care, qu high quality child care in every one of those communities is a very important um, aspect of what we do. The other um, part is that we, we are um, also an early childhood program. We, we service children um, through CCDBG birth to 12 years old, 13, however, um, we really focus on zero to three services for our area as well. Um, our community outreach is um, exceptional, if I do say so myself. Uh, we rely on partner to um, expand our services and bring it to all areas of our service area. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, that that has baffled me over the years is that um, the attention or the lack of attention that child care has been um, receiving. And uh, the first thing I need to say is the best thing that ever happened to child care was the CCDBG funding. And um, we're very fortunate to, to receive that. However, it's, it's still not enough. Um, we, you know, every parent in the world has to deal with child care and when uh, when they go to school or to work, even our first lady, Michelle Obama, had to worry about child care for her girls when she was, and she was very fortunate to have a wonderful um, FFN provider, um, her mom, to care for her children. Every person in this room and watching this event has, has a, who has a child or children has had to deal with child care, where to find it, how to pay for it, and to want, wondering if it's quality. So to have child care underfund, is, have it so underfunded is, is really um, hurting our country and, and our nation, but especially our families and, and children. We, um, one of the things that we do that, that I think is innovative is that we're not just a child care program, like I said earlier, but we look at the whole family. We work with our partners to um, do school alignment, preschool, uh, pre-K alignment. We want to have services and child care just like any other early childhood program um, so that our children are receiving um, assessments, screening, uh, resources. Uh, we provide children in child care um, the same resources. Uh, we work on quality rating systems, um, curriculum. We invest in our child care teachers through professional development. We work on um, CDA uh, associates and bachelors. We support them and work with our local universities and colleges to make that happen. Uh, we work with our our parents um, on parent conferences and parent engagement um, because it is true that uh, the learning is happening in child care but if, and we want that continuing of learning to go home. Um, we also, and I think you can go to the next slide please. Uh, these are examples of our, some of the services that we provide. We feel strongly that every child, no matter if they are in a license, our unlicensed child care deserve the same early childhood screenings and resources, um, not only that, that we reach out to children who aren't, as well as reaching out to children who aren't in any kind of program. In every community, about one-third of the children are in either a Head Start or preschool, and about another third or more are in some form of child care. And there's also a large population of kids out there that aren't in anything. And they deserve to be given the same opportunities and resources 
um, that these other children receive. We need, you know, our country needs to invest in all early childhood programs in order to reach out to all, all children, um, especially children from high poverty areas. It uh, does not mean they deserve less. Um, and so programs like ours, um, we really take that seriously and try to reach out to all areas. Um, our program works closely with state and local um, officials, and especially in this day and age of shortage of funds and resources, we respect our, and value our partnerships because we couldn't do it without their support and guidance. And many of the initiatives that you see on the screen are, are um, all based on our partnerships and our collaboration to make these things happen for our area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the things that I think we are very fortunate here in Minnesota is that our state of Minnesota uh, is very inclusive of tribal child care programs, and they're very inclusive of tribal input uh, on its statewide initiatives. My experience on my national board tells me this isn't the case in all states. But um, as far as Minnesota, they have, um, I think they've, they're very um, innovative. They've developed the first ever tribal child care specific network, and it's called MinTrack. And our program um, communicates on a regular basis with um, the state and our, our colleagues and our counterparts in the, in the counties around child care assistance and licensing so that we're all on the same page. We're a multifaceted agency that may have started small but has become a multi-service agency, multi agency for providing accessible, affordable, and high-quality child care, community outreach um, to supporting parents who are working on getting their children back or keeping their children. Uh, we work with CANF parents on child care issues, and we simply support our partners in what they're trying to do because most of the time we're all dealing with the same children and families. CCDBG reauthorization needs to happen. Um, what we see is that uh, without it, our parents are struggling. And I think, um, you know, Everything that the panel, my, the people on the panel have said is so true in all areas, but it, it's so critical that CCDBG get reauthorized. I think if that's one thing, one message, is that that needs to happen. Um, our tribal set-aside needs to be increased as well. Um, both states and tribes are having to either deal with um, quality versus quantity, and we shouldn't have to do that. Um, but our, our parents and our families are depending on us to uh, bring them the resources that they may not otherwise get. So I think um, by us working with our, co our partnering agencies such as Head Start, um, school systems, our social services, we are, um, we are only stronger in that sense. Uh, they look to us for providing that quality child care in remote areas. In our neck of the woods, that's what they do. Um, they also look to us to help pay for their child care. Um, it's hard to see parents being turned away from both counties and tribal pro child care programs because of long waiting lists. And we you know, they usually end up having to quit their jobs and going on TANF, or they, you know, um, provide, or may have to select a child care that's probably not appropriate. So I think by um, us being, you know, working together, it's going to only make sense for, for the parents. Next slide, please. These are some more initiatives that we do. Um, since the ch we received funding for CCDBG, 
We've also recruited um, and uh, applied and received other funding for early childhood initiatives. Um, the Caring for Kids store is something that is ongoing. It's for parents and providers that attend training conferences, um, parent conferences, uh, well child checks, WIC appointments. They get points. So all the partners um, provide items for the store and parents, they can go and um, cash in their points at this store. So it's very, um, very successful here. And the, the things that fly off the ha uh, shelves are the basic household needs of um, diapers and uh, laundry soap. So those are the kinds of things, you know, our parents are, are really needing. Um, celebrating our children, Father's Festival, Week of the Young Child, those are things that we do with the community. Um, we highlight early childhood at, um, in these events, and we, we get huge numbers of children and, and parents coming to these. So we're constantly marketing, marketing, marketing um, early childhood, what early childhood is, and child development, brain development, um, and everything we do. Um, we, we work with our early childhood mental health agencies. We have a Readmobile and that, um, that goes out to remote areas and do home visiting. We have an anti-bullying committee, and you can go to the next slide. Barb, I'm gonna, um, say, Barb, take another, just another minute here. I'm going to try to jump in here as we want to get as to many questions as we can, if you would. Okay. Um, the Readmobile uh, service is something that we take out to remote areas. Um, I think the remoteness of our child care providers is what's really, um, uh, it, it's really something that we need to pay attention to. We need to pay attention to our child care providers and centers no matter where they are and give them the right attention. Next slide, please. And these are just some of the things that I feel what needs to happen. Great. Thank you. Great, Barb. I'm sorry to jump in there. We want to get to Q&A. And you had covered some of this last slide, which I thought was particularly helpful to look at, yeah, to look at the um, uh, what needs to happen question, which has been on my mind as I've listened to all the speakers. We're going to turn to Katie Britton here to just talk for a moment about Boston, and then we'll open it up for, for Q&A. Katie? Sure. Um, and I, like Barbara, can't see the slides either. Um, I'm here at United Way, and they like us, but they don't seem to like your website. Um, so <laughs> if we can just, maybe I can just say next slide when I'm ready. Sure. Um, so Thrive in Five is a public-private partnership between United Way and the city of Boston. We take a really holistic approach that focuses on getting all the adults in a young child's life, as you can kind of see in our equation, um, working together to support their readiness for and then success in school. Um, so today I'm going to talk about our work to improve quality and access to early ed and early learning opportunities, both you know, formal child care and then more informal opportunities. Um, so I'm going to start with some of our ready educators' work and talk about the state environment, how that's impacted our local strategies, um, focused mainly on quality and professional development, and then also talk about um, one of our sort of signature place-based initiatives called Boston, Boston Children Thrive. Um, and some of our work to develop parent leadership in that. So, next slide. Um, so, a little bit of state context. Uh, in Massachusetts, we have, I think, one of the first um, in the country's, um, you know, sort of state-level departments focused solely on early care and education, and that started back in 2005. Um, in 2010, our state commissioner launched our quality rating and improvement system, which is becoming more and more prevalent across the country, <laughs> certainly. Um, and that, I think, is really quickly becoming one of the biggest drivers of um, quality improvement in, in kind of our local community and then statewide, largely because most of the funding streams um, for quality and for early care and education are being more and more often are dependent on being in the, Q the QRIS. That's what we call it here. Um, it has a great, <laughs> a great family-friendly name at this point. Um, so Massachusetts also received a $50 million Race to the Top grant as well, um, much of which is also focused on our QRIS. Um, so right now the state offers grants to programs to 
implement improvements to move them forward in the QRIS. A lot of our local partners, we're seeing um, different state grants to local partners to do professional development and, and things like that, working specifically with providers at different levels in our QRIS. So you, know, you have to be at level three to participate in a particular training or something like that. Um, and then starting later this summer, um, our commissioner is planning to require programs who would offer um, any subsidized slots or vouchers to also be in the QRIS. So I think that's going to be an even bigger driver to get programs to enroll in that. And I think the challenge is, I mean, it, it's a great system certainly to improve quality, but I think like any new system, um, particularly in the child care community, you have, um, you know, a large group of providers who are already, you know, doing the best they can to meet a lot of different requirements. And so it's, it's new standards for an already kind of stressed community. And also in our QRIS, we have really high professional development standards, um, which is making it really hard for providers to move beyond um, the first level in the system. So um, I'll touch on that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so locally, our focus has historically been on achieving accreditation, um, and we've done really well with that. About a third of our early capacity in Boston is accredited. Um, so it's taken some time, I think, for the local early ed community to shift from accreditation to QRIS as the main driver of quality. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with local partners about, you know, okay, so what's our goal here? Is it to, you know, move programs forward in the QRIS or is it to continue to pursue accreditation? Um, because in our state, those two aren't exactly aligned. Um, and we have now settled on moving forward with the QRIS. Um, so Thrive and Five and our local partners, including Head Start, our um, local public school district, which offers um, pre-K services for three and four and five-year-olds, and several of our major early ed providers and some of our accreditation technical assistance providers have all come together to develop a plan to bring more programs into and up the QRIS um, through a couple of different strategies. I mean, the first is information sessions just to help providers better understand what is it, you know, what's my incentive for being a part of this, um, what do I need to do and kind of what's the process. Um, I think shifting some of the accreditation coaches and the technical assistance work that we have there um, to focus more on moving into and up the QRIS. And then also, similar to what the state has done, um, looking for um, private funders to support mini grants to programs to do some quality improvements to move them into and up QRIS as well. Um, so, and since accreditation has been a focus for so long, I think another big um, focus locally is helping providers kind of um, align, you know, what, what, where are we with accreditation and then what does that mean for the QRIS? So helping them um, kind of coordinate between those two different standards. And the goal is, you know, with all of this is to keep different state resources in our local community um, and hopefully increase that funding over time. So I think this has been a great example of where you know, all the local partners kind of at the table, many of which receive state funding and federal funding, have come together to develop kind of a local strategy that really looks at kind of the individual needs of our community um, to address sort of the new standards that the state has put out. Next slide. So alongside quality, professional development has also been a major focus in our kind of early ed and care work. Um, we are fortunate to have a group in Boston called Boston Equip, the Early Childhood Quality Improvement Project. That's a local um, policy and research initiative solely focused on the child care community um, that regularly does <laughs> different studies about um, what does quality look like, what do providers need in terms of professional development, um, all sorts of different things. So they, they provide us with sort of a gold mine of research. Um, and their latest research around professional development shows that we really need um, more targeted professional development on instructional support, curriculum, language and literacy, um, and screening and assessment stuff. Um, so, and we also know that anecdotally, we hear that providers really need more support translating the coursework into practice in the classroom with children. Um, and as I said before, I think the QRIS has really highlighted our professional development needs. So to move beyond the first level, which is the basic licensing standards, all the staff in a program have to have a high school diploma or GED. All the, edu all the educators, so all the teachers, must have college credit. Um, and half of the classrooms have to have an educator with a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, and it's certainly what we want um, and what we know really makes a difference for kids. 
but it's not, it's just not where we are in Boston right now. Um, so some of our strategies here are to test out new professional development models that focus on the content areas where we know that providers need additional support and that also provide the credential and training that help them move up the QRIS. Um, all while focused on doing this through models that embed kind of commuter, computer literacy into that, since we know that that's becoming more and more of a challenge um, for many of our programs to sort of get online and, and start to fill out, you know, state applications and things like that. Um, so some of the activities that we're doing around that are, the first is really simple. It's just helping providers better navigate the opportunities that are out there um, because we do have a lot of professional development that's happening, but often we're hearing from providers that, you know, they're sort of taking the same course over and over again, but with a slightly different name. Um, so they're not really kind of moving forward with a degree program. Um, the second is just incorporating coaching and mentoring into classes um, to really help providers incorporate what they're learning in the classroom into their actual um, practice with young children. And then a third um, is scaling up and kind of expanding a pilot that we've done with family child care providers, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, so next slide. Uh, okay, so our family child care pro um, pilot started last spring. Uh, the goal was to develop professional development opportunities that specifically meet the needs of family child care providers, which in Boston is a really diverse community. Um, so we started out with hosting a summit for providers from the field. Um, and we did really specific and intensive outreach, I would say, to um, five major language groups in Boston, so English, Spanish, Chinese, Haitian, and Portuguese um, to cover our Cape Verdean population. Um, and they came back and, and had some good recommendations. Um, the first is obviously you can't have like a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, they really were looking for multiple pathways to higher education. Um, the second, given the diversity of this community, is to focus on, you know, kind of the skills and content while promoting English language acquisition and literacy. Um, Many of our providers are are challenged just by not not having a good grasp of the English language at this point. So, um, you know, offering courses in native language, but also offering specific vocational ESL programs um, for the early ed community would be helpful to them as well. And then also supporting um, their computer literacy and business management skills. So, since the summit, um, we've partnered with a couple of our higher ed institutions. Um, to develop new curricula and also offer a few different courses kind of following um, what the recommendations, um, following the recommendations that we heard from providers. So we do, we are now offering a vocational ESOL class for um, our family child care providers, um, mainly Spanish speakers, I believe, at this point. Um, we're also offering a financial literacy course for providers, um, and that one, you know, come also kind of takes into account another recommendation is to have a, a really sort of um, condensed schedule. So that I think that course meets um, for three full days and then three evenings. Um, and that's the whole course, um, sort of to better accommodate the busy schedules of our providers. And then um, the third is a, um, a course focused on promoting children's language and literacy development. And it's offered in Spanish and has a, that coaching and mentoring part of it. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing the results of those courses as they start to wrap up later in the spring. Um, and this is something, you know, I think, um, you know, based on the results of this, this is something that we might want to expand to our center-based um, providers as well or look at other models um, that may be successful in kind of um, helping expand the professional development opportunities that our providers um, can access in the community. So next slide. Um, so that's been the major focus of our work with formal early education and care. And I thought I'd just touch briefly on some of our work on kind of other informal early, op early learning opportunities and also connecting families to resources in the community. Um, and most of this work has fallen into our Boston Children Thrive initiative. And that's a, a neighborhood-based effort to engage families in their children's learning and development starting at birth. 
Um, that grew out of the reality that in Boston we have a ton of early childhood resources. Um, Boston is known for being resource-rich and coordination poor. Um, so while we have a lot of different things happening, we kept hearing from families over and over that they, didn't, they couldn't access them. They didn't know where they were or they weren't at the right time or they weren't in the right language or just you know, multiple barriers to actually taking advantage of these opportunities, particularly for our most vulnerable families. So in 2009, we launched Boston Children Thrive in five neighborhoods. Um, each neighborhood is led by a hub agency that has a strong group of core partners kind of across different fields, everywhere from early ed to the business community to healthcare to um, family support providers. And these um, partners come together um, regularly through a group that they call the School Readiness Roundtable um, in each community, and that's the hub agency, all their partners, but also parents and other community members. And they are really charged with planning and carrying out the neighborhood strategies to connect families, particularly focusing on families, our kind of most vulnerable families and those most at risk for falling into the achievement gap um, once children enter school with um, the various resources and supports that the community has to offer. And we found so far this has been a really, um, it's not an insignificant cost in our budget, certainly. It's about a million dollar um, initiative every year. Um, so it's a, a, but still a fairly low financial investment for a high impact in reaching families and connecting with them in a really real way. Um, next slide. So I would say that even though the model is very neighborhood directive, um, Thrive in Five provides the outcomes, but the communities um, through their school readiness roundtables really decide on the strategies that they use to meet those outcomes. Um, it does look different in each neighborhood, but a couple of core strategies have emerged um, that we see as really promising practices to expand. Um, so in each community, we have 23 um, across, across the city at this point. Um, parent ambassadors are parent partners who are there specifically to reach out to and engage families right where they are. So these parents hang out at the laundromat, they hang out at the bus stop. Um, they hang out at the playground, and we found that it's been really helpful, particularly in um, most of the neighborhoods, most of the Boston Children's Thrive neighborhoods have a high immigrant population, so we have parent partners from Costa Rica, Brazil, Cape Verde, Haiti, Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, um, and more countries who I think are really sort of a cultural bridge um, between a lot of the programs in the community and um, families who may not feel as comfortable um, with kind of our customs and traditions and, and services here. Um, the, another um, common strategy that we've really encouraged is partnerships with local businesses. So at this point we have about 40 businesses engaged who give out information to families. They give out family fun kits to families with young children. Um, they display information um, about early childhood resources. Um, this is an example in our um, Dudley Children Thrive neighborhood. Uh, a local market owner also runs a Cape Verdean radio station. So they've become really taken with this and now make regular announcements about events and opportunities in Cape Verdean. I think they have a weekly radio show about early childhood issues. Um, so it's just another way to kind of get the word out in um, ways that really connect with different cultural communities. Um, a third Maybe strategy take one, that's take been... Take one more minute. Take one more minute if you... Sure. Want to yeah. Um, so there's just the other two major strategies are just mini grants to support new and expanded programming and then also neighborhood-wide activities and field trips. Um, we found that a lot of families haven't even come to our children's museum, which I can see from my office window, but is, is you know, pretty far removed when you, you know, maybe don't have um, great public transportation or um, just the time in your schedule. So that's been a really successful um, thing is to bring families kind of out of the neighborhood and bring resources directly into the neighborhood when possible. Um, next slide, and this is my last one, promise. Um, I think that one big part of this um, and one of our big goals with Boston Children Thrive is around parent leadership. So in, um, to achieve that goal, we've sponsored um, so far the first um, session of an a initiative called the Parent Leadership Exchange, which is a 10-week course on leadership skills. Um, and from that course, so far we have 12 graduates who um, are leading projects in their own communities to engage more families. Um, and I think this has been one of the most really, like, the most impactful thing that we've done. Um, 
just in terms of getting families um, involved in their children's education, but also involved in bettering their whole community. Um, so much so that we had, we had a parent from our East Boston neighborhood who you know, said that she really didn't know that she was a leader. She was afraid to get up and speak in front of other people. And just last week she came and presented with us to a group of um, a local education funders group. And you know, I was talking to some of the heads of our major foundations and business leaders in the area about you know, the success of this and how it's impacted her life. So it's just been really great. It's created a lot of um, real positive change so far in the community and I think is the beginning of um, it's just so much easier to engage parents right there in the beginning and then to, to see those parents grow into you know, leaders in their child's schools and leaders in their community later on I think is going to be really exciting. So that's our, Katie, that's thank our work. You. You can see the diversity of the experience and the success and folks have had. I want to ask, um, and we're going to have Claire go around with the microphone. Lisa and Tanja can join in the questions as well. I'm going to ask each of you to list um, if there's a single thing in reauthorization, the biggest problem that each of you face, you're going to take, uh, no, don't explain it all, but just list it. Um, you're in a room of folks here who are interested in, in CCDBG reauthorization. Is it more resources, the lack of quality, connecting parents, professional development for teachers. What is the single biggest problem you face at the local level uh, if Washington could do something to help? Aaron and, uh, Aaron and Kathy, what would be your single biggest need? Um, our single biggest, biggest need, I think we're really um, doing quite well with improving quality and the movements we're having forward. We're starting to see some nice results in our data. For us, it's really increasing capacity and the numbers we can serve. Great. Okay. Um, we capacity are, and number right needs. I'm going to be ruthless on the time here. So, so, so on the, the biggest need there, Monica, what's your biggest need that we could, could help? If I would say it's uh, flexibility in the, in the use of funds um, and increased capacity. Okay. Thanks. Barb? It would be increased capacity um, and child care um, assistance funding. Okay. Katie? I would say for us it's professional development. Very good. Very interesting. All right, folks in the room, what pressing questions do you have for our panel? Sir. Uh, I was curious, the woman from White Earth mentioned a father's festival. I wonder if the other communities have done any specific work with fathers. Very good. Um, that they can talk about. Okay, good. We're gonna we're gonna uh, pack a couple questions. Any let's see other questions, then we'll we'll open it up for the group here. Are there other questions from folks in the house? Lisa, Tanja. I, I, would, I would be interested in just learning a little bit more about um, whether there are barriers to having, uh, some of this was touched on by Tulsa, but barriers to having parents involved in um, these kind of community college programs that might be out there, um, and if, if there's just no capacity even among child care centers to do that extra work, it's kind of amazing that Tulsa's taking that on. But I'd like to learn about um, what are the barriers to making that connection to higher education institutions for the parents, not just okay. for the providers. Okay. Tanja, do you have something on your mind? That's uh, something related to the, the parents as well. I mean, the very diverse communities being served, and I was just interested in one or two specific strategies for engaging very culturally diverse parents want to hear how they were um, connecting to the, those folks. All right, so we've got three questions here for now. Let's just take those three for, for we'll get to, to the last one in a second here. So for the folks on the phone, here's what we're going to do. You've got three questions and for, um, so the first one's on fathers. Uh, for uh, Katie, Aaron, it builds on something Barbara's already doing, but um, why don't you each answer one of the following questions. So. The one is, is there a way to connect fathers more specifically to your projects? Secondly, on community colleges and higher education, how are there strategies such as Monica talked about that are connecting to higher education? And the third one is diverse communities of parents. So let's go down again. We're going to go in opposite order, starting with Katie this time, and touch on to one of those three questions um, about fathers, community colleges, higher education, and diverse community of parents. Uh, is there anything that you have to contribute that has been experiential um, on, on one of those three questions? 
Sure. Well, I, I'll, I'll stick with the um, diverse communities of parents because we, we have a lot of diversity in Boston. Um, so that's something that we deal with every day. I think there, you know, we found that to really engage parents, um, you, have to, you have to plan everything around them, um, everything from the time of the meeting to, you know, the agenda and the way that you facilitate, you know, parents being involved and being part of a discussion. Um, I think specifically to reach out to our different cultural communities, um, we've really found, you know, having people on staff particularly um, in our Boston Children's Thrive neighborhoods who, you know, are from those communities um, and sort of understand the barriers um, and can kind of be the, the, you know, transition point between, um, you know, kind of our um, programs and services and, and that cultural community um, has been really successful. I think it adds a lot of legitimacy to the work that we're doing when there's someone, you know, who looks like you, who, you know, understands your background and where you come from and speaks your language, who can talk about it and, and speak about it from their own experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think having that, um, those parents there. I would say the other thing that's been, um, I think it's, it's small, but <laughs> I think it has a big impact in a lot of our neighborhoods is all of our school readiness roundtables, they generally meet, um, they all have parents um, on those groups and they generally meet at times when parents can be there. And they generally have food that is specific to the cultural community that's most dominant in that neighborhood. Um, so, you know, I'll go to one meeting and it's all Vietnamese food and then I'll go to another meeting and it's all, um, you know, kind of keep there in and North African food. And for me, it's wonderful because I get great food every Sounds everywhere I great. go. But I think it just shows some acceptance um, and That's some great. real, you know, effort to reach out. So, thank you, Katie. Barb, um, I think with the, the community co um, communities and colleges, <clears throat> especially in rural areas, it's hard to for our childcare um, providers and center staff to get a day off to go to college. So we have to think outside the box and look at our partners to find out how we can map this out so that it's user friendly for our providers to either get a CDA, to start with the CDA, or go on to their associates and bachelors. So we're looking at hybrid um, classes for those providers, um, as well as offering those classes to Head Start, um, Pre-Ks, and Paras out of the school district. So we're bringing everybody together to say this is what um, early childhood um, people want, so how can you serve us? Mm -hmm. We're going to, before uh, Monica speaks here, we're going to go one more round of questions. So we'll stay another five or ten minutes, but because it's 1.30 and folks may be leaving, uh, I'll just put a plug, both in thanks for the Casey Foundation. Also, Linda Smith from the Office of Child Care will be here. Our next event will be May 16th with Linda and some other folks talking about the federal efforts and quality in particular. All right, with that plug, um, Monica? Yeah, I'm going to tackle Lisa's question, but I will just note that the engaging fathers has been a challenge. Um, we had hoped that our health information technology track would be a little bit more mm -hmm. attractive um, to the fathers, and uh, we're still kind of working through that, but it definitely is a challenge. So the way we, I think, successfully connect our parents to the community college and our local um, technology VOTEC system, I think really is through our career coach. Mm. Um, the career coaches really help. First of all, they have to understand the path and all the steps to getting into the school, and they help the participants navigate it. Um, we also, for the first step in the training ladder, we buy a full class. So the participant's first class is only going to be with career advanced participants, although it is at the college. So they are at the college. They feel like they're college students. They're wearing their scrubs. They have their books and et cetera. Um, and then as they move along, they progress a little bit more individually on their own. Um, and then we also try really hard to connect our participants to whatever support services the college or the VOTEC offers for their students. So we don't want to try to hold their hand too much. Um, we want them to learn how to navigate that system on their own, but there definitely is some coaching and, and assistance on the front end. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, Aaron or Kathy? Um, we would like to, to speak to um, tackling the cultural diversity in, in each of our 10 uh, bridges sites. 
they are each very culturally different, and um, I think each one really has to get the pulse and the flavor, and by bringing the community into the development of that site, um, brings the culture to the site as well. Um, so we offer as many volunteer opportunities as possible, parent engagement, but also something that we've seen that's worked is to involve adult literacy uh, with classes both day and night, um, again, to cater to you know the, the needs of families, working families. Um, and one particular program that is, is working very well is our family literacy program, which is a component of ESOL and GED. And for those parents that have three and four year olds that are not in child care settings, they bring their children as well and they are part of a parents and child together program where the children are in a pre-K type setting. Uh, the parents are in separate classrooms learning and we get together once a week to do uh, family um, family education programming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. Very good. We had a, a question here. Um, all right, good. We'll talk more then. Are there any other questions? Will you join me in thanking our uh, guests for taking time being on the phone? Tanja, thank you very much for uh, being here today and providing your insight. We're, it's so great to think about the diversity of our country in terms of, of um, programs at the local level providing uh, innovative opportunities for children. Everyone here is committed to the outcome of mo social mobility and, and dual generational uh, quality child care. We really appreciate you all being here today. So uh, thank you for that. Thanks for all the folks who've watched um, online. And we are adjourned. Thank you, friends. Take care.